Donc, bienvenue à la séquence de, de séminaire de l'année 2021, qui va se poursuivre sur Zoom, évidemment, à cause de la pandémie. Um, on a déjà plusieurs conférenciers confirmés là, pour uh, cette session, mais si vous avez des idées, des suggestions, n'hésitez pas à nous contacter. On a quand même quelques um, disponibilités là, vers uh, la fin de l'hiver, uh, début printemps. Je pense qu'on peut commencer. Donc, uh, cette semaine, uh, on est, uh, je suis très heureux de, de recevoir Benoît Estienne, qui nous vient de la France, uh, de Paris, et uh, de la Sorbonne Université au laboratoire de physique théorique et des autres énergies. Euh, donc, Benoît est un physicien, mais avec euh, un background euh, mathématique euh, assez fort. Euh, il a fait son, son PhD au même endroit, à Sorbonne Université. Et après, il a fait deux postdocs. Le premier à l'Université d'Amsterdam, aux Pays-Bas, et le second à Princeton, aux États-Unis. Benoît est un expert dans les systèmes de Hall quantique, en particulier euh, les systèmes de Hall quantique fractionnaires. Donc, des systèmes fortement corrélés avec euh, des excitations euh, topologiques, des anions. Et euh, d'autres choses aussi, Benoît a travaillé beaucoup sur euh, l'intrication quantique dans les systèmes euh, n corps. Euh, C'est un expert dans la physique à une dimension qui est aussi relié à la physique de l'effort quantique. Euh, donc, sans plus attendre, euh, je vais laisser la parole à Benoît qui va nous parler de euh, l'intrication quantique dans les systèmes d'art quantique. Et Benoît, uh, your talk will be in which language today? Yes, English. Maybe. English. So, Benoît will talk in English. Sorry. And the slides are in English as well? Or? They are, yeah. Okay, so it's, uh, but if you have questions in French for Benoît, please feel free. He, he's a native French speaker, obviously. But uh, for the sake of everyone, the talk will be in English. Uh, so, Benoît, à toi la parole. Merci. Uh, merci, William, uh, pour l'intro et pour l'invitation. C'est un plaisir de, de présenter mon travail. So, maybe I'll just switch to English because I'm just more used to presenting you know, scientific work in English. So, uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about entanglement entropy in the integer quantum mole effect. And uh, so, my co workers on this are. Uh, for the first part of what I'm going to talk about is Laurent Chao, who is a, a mathematician and also in Sorbonne University in Paris. And well, for Benoit, the last... uh, just uh, perhaps you should share your screen unless, are you sharing your screen? I think I you are. I'm sharing. Okay, so maybe I'm not seeing it. Sorry, sorry. Let me, let it's me all share good. again. No, no, it's all good, I think. Um, is, it, is it sharing now? So maybe you are sharing and I think you have the... Can you see now the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The slides, good. All right, so my, so my first co-worker is Laurent Charles, who's a mathematician in Paris. And my second co-worker for this project is Jean-Marie Stéphan, who's a physicist uh, in a math institute in Lyon. And okay, maybe I guess soon I'll add uh, William as also as a co-worker on this topic. Now we're working on some things, but I'm not, not gonna talk about these things today. So here's an outline of the talk. I'm gonna make a brief introduction about entanglement entropy and why it's important for a physicist, at least for uh, theoreticians. And <clears throat> then I'm gonna be interested in the entanglement entropy in the integer quantum mole effect, which is a problem of non-interacting fermions. And for non-interacting fermions, so obviously life is easier than for strongly correlated systems. So it turned out there's a trick to reduce the calculation of the entanglement entropy to a one body problem. So I'll mention a bit how this works. And then, you know, I'll delve into the, the main part of the talk, which is integer quantum mole effect maybe a, a, a brief review of, of what it is, and then what are the results on entanglement entropy in, in these systems. So uh, <clears throat> entanglement entropy, so it's really a property of, of quantum mechanics. It doesn't really have an analog in classical physics. In classical physics, if I give you the state of uh, <clears throat> half the system, say the left part of the system and the right part of the system, then you know the state of the whole system. In quantum mechanics, that is not so. Uh, you could think about a 1D spin chain like is depicted here. So you have a, a 
bunch of spins, maybe a finite number, maybe an infinite number, it doesn't really matter. And then you, you split them, you declare some of the sites are pot A and the rest is pot B. So you split your system in two and then the total Hilbert space is a tensor product of, well, the Hilbert space of the, for the spins in pot A, tensor the Hilbert space of the spins in pot B. And then you pick your favorite quantum states, say the ground state of the Heisenberg model, for instance, or the X exit chain, or pick a ground state, pick or pick an excited state. And then you ask how much entanglement is there between part A and part B. And what is entanglement if so, in some sense, it's a failure of being able to reconstruct the whole system from knowing exactly the state of the system in part A and the state of the system in part B. So maybe to be specific, let me pick an example with two spins. So you could have a spin, you could have up times up. If I say use as part A is up and the part B is up, then you know the state of the system. That's fine. And that's a product state. So the total state is just a tensor product of state in part A times the state in part B. And in, in such a case, you would say there's no entanglement. But you could well also have like an EPR pair, or for instance, up, up, plus down, down, over square root of two. And then well, what's a, if you trace out the the spin B, what's the state of uh, the subsystem A? Well, it's uh, the spin is either off, is either up or down with equal probability. It's the same state for part B. If I just give you this information, there's no way you can know what was the initial state. And in that case, you have entanglement. So in that case, it looks like it's pretty easy to see whether there's entanglement or not. But then if you look at the third example, if you take an equal superposition of up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down, this looks pretty intricate. And in fact, it is not, you can factorize it. It's up plus down over square root of two times the same thing. So you see already for two spin, well, okay, if you work a bit, you can figure it out. But now if I give you a thousand spin, that's gonna be a lot harder to know whether there's an entanglement or not. And moreover, we haven't really quantified it so far, I just told you what is entanglement, but now we want to ask how much entanglement. So a possible way to quantify it is via the von Neumann entanglement entropy, which goes as follow. Uh, you trace over, so you start from a pure state. You could also start from not a pure state. Uh, for instance, you could add temperature, but let's start, say we are at zero temperature, we look at a ground state. And then you trace over B. So you look at the row A, that's a reduced density matrix that describes the subsystem A. And even if the initial state was a pure state, typically the A now subsystem is not a pure state anymore. It's a statistical superposition of a bunch of states. It's a little A alpha. And each of them come with probability P alpha. So the sum of the P alpha is one, there are probabilities. So you have a bunch of probabilities. Out of this, you can, I mean, uh, information theory to use as a natural candidate for measuring entropy. It's a fundamental entropy. So minus some alpha of this P alpha log P alpha. If you go back to the more quantum object, which was a reduced density matrix, what you're looking at is minus trace of rho a log rho a. So what are the properties of this object? So let's just, we're gonna say decay, that's measures how much entanglement there is. So for, for starters, the entropy of part A is the same as entropy of part B. So if, from in the whole talk, A is gonna be some region and B is gonna be the complement. This quantity is also positive and it is zero if and only if there is no entanglement. And then there are some more further, more subtle properties like strong subadditivity. Not gonna need these things, so not really gonna mention them. So that's what we want to quantify in, in condensed matter system. For theorists, it's pretty important to be able to predict how much entanglement there is in a given system. So why is that important? Well, for instance, for quantum computation, without entanglement entropy, you can't do anything. So it's a resource you need. So that's important to understand it and control it. For a uh, theorist, it's important because uh, if you understand well how much, I mean, how entangled are your quantum many body states, uh, you can design new algorithms to, that are on for classical computers are going to be quite efficient, such as, such as density matrix renormalization groups or the matrix product states in 1D or more generally all these class of uh, <coughs> algorithm based on tensor networks such as the PEPs, uh, I think it's projected and tangled pair states, MIRA, which acronym, I don't quite remember what it is, but all these things are based on tensor networks is so extremely efficient because of some properties, which I'm gonna mention later, which is the area law. 
And for purely the theorists, a thought experiment turns out uh, entanglement entropy is an extremely good probe. If you, you're given a quantum state, like you diagonalize in your computer some Hamiltonian, many body problem maybe you've managed to solve with 20 electrons, you have a, a ground state in a Hilbert space that is a dimension is a, a billion. So you have a huge quantum state that takes all your hard drive and then what can you do with that? Uh, you'd like to ask, is it a gap state? Is it a gapless state? Is it a topological order? It turns out if you compute entanglement entropy in that state, that would give you a lot of information about the state. Uh, for instance, if you are in a in 1D system, it's going to be pretty easy to see if it's gapped or if it's critical. If it's critical, you can have the central charge for free. Uh, so there's really lots of things you can get out of this entanglement entropy. Um, <clears throat> so if you're a theorist, what is objective is you'd like to compute this entanglement entropy to predict it. In So what's a typical, uh, what's the assumptions you make? You need A and B to be special region. You're not going to factor your Hilbert space in a very weird way. Because in fact, the, there's a strong interplay with locality in, in this business. A and B must be large, so contain a large number of degrees of freedom. And typically, we're going to look at uh, zero temperature, so ground state of Hamiltonians. So what do we know about ground state of uh, Hamiltonians and their entanglement entropy? Well, typically, in the vast majority of cases, you have an area law. That means so here you have the, a, a graphical depiction of, of partitioning the system into two spatial regions A and B. And typically you'll find that the entanglement entropy in a ground state of a local Hamiltonian will scale like as a volume of the boundary between A and B. So it's not an extensive quantity. It doesn't grow with the size of A, it grows with the size of the boundary of A, which is much less. <clears throat> So that's true in the vast majority of cases, so, but not all of them. So when do we expect this to hold? Uh, so it holds, um, it's not really a theorem, but in all cases we know if you have a system that is gap. So if there's a spectral gap on top of your ground state, it's not a critical system. So gap, everything decays exponentially. So you have a finite correlation length. Well, <clears throat> in that case, it is expected that you have this area low. So it's called area because people mostly think in three dimension, in which case the boundary of A is a surface. So why, that's why people say area, but I'm gonna say area no matter the dimension. So it always means the boundary of A. And then you can look at the uh, correction to the area low. So in 1D, you find uh, exponentially small correction. There's uh, some computation, at least for integrable models with some universal uh, decay based on Bessel functions. So exponentially small corrections. In 2D is more interesting. So the area low, uh, so the, in, in two dimension, it's really it's a, the boundary is a, is a length. So the, the leading term here, CL of XI is at the area low. So it goes with a perimeter of, the, of A. So the, and the first correction is a constant correction, which is universal, which that's very interesting in the sense that if you change the microscopic detail of your model, or if you add some irrelevant perturbation to your theory, that number will not change. And that number is topological in, well, in the sense that if you have a gapped system, if you really go to the deep in, uh, infrared limit in which you send all masses to infinity, what's left is a quantum, is a topological field theory. So if you have a topologically trivial theory, there's, there's literally nothing left, it's a trivial theory, and then that number is zero. But if you have topological matter, such as a fractional quantum mole effect or a toric code or models like this, then that number will not be zero. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. So if, for instance, you can detect topological order but just by looking at the correction to the area low in the entanglement entropy. Uh, <clears throat> so I've mentioned results about gap system. What about critical system? Well, mostly for critical systems, you find the same results. At least when the dimension, the space dimension is at is two or more, and you're looking at a, <clears throat> at a conformally invariant critical point, then in that case, it is expected that you still have an area law. So not much difference here, but there are some cases in which the area law is violated with an extra log term. Uh, so for instance, the, the, the standard example in any dimension is a metal, you take a Fermi C and, <clears throat> and you look at the entanglement entropy and instead of finding L to the D minus one, which would be a pure area law, you find this times log L. So there's a log violation, there's a bit more entanglement. 
And another case where it is uh, very well established that you have these logs is in 1D critical system. Uh, so if you take a 1D, so a CFT in, in 1 plus 1, and you compute the entanglement entropy, that's uh, the seminal results by uh, O.C., Larson, and Wilsek, and then it was kind of rediscovered uh, by Cardi and Calabrese, you uh, find that you have a log L uh, entropy. It grows as, so L is the size of the interval. Now you're, you're in 1D, so you have, should look at the bottom right picture. You have a 1D line, and A is just some interval. L is the length of that interval. So if you add an area low, well, uh, you can increase the size of A. The boundary is two point, it doesn't change. So you'd find a constant entropy. And for gap system, you do find a constant entropy. So if your critical system, it blows up as a logarithm, the logarithm of the size of this interval. And what's also very interesting is that the prefactor is also universal. It's essentially up to factor three. It's a central charge of your theory. So I was mentioning before, you can extract the central charge of, of, a, of a critical system just by looking at the entanglement entry, uh, <clears throat> which is quite interesting because you don't need to know, for instance, what is a Fermi velocity. If you look at the spectrum, you always have to worry about what's a Fermi velocity if you want to extract the central charge. Here, you don't even need to know that. That's kind of easier to, to get the central charge this way. All right, so maybe let me mention an example in which one can compute things exactly in 1D and to see really is a crossover between gapped and critical. So that system is a, a SSH chain and it's, it's a very simple, it's a non-interacting system. It's tight binding uh, a model. So electrons can, uh, they can hop from a blue side to a red side. And the only thing is you have, you have staggered hopping terms. So when you hop from the, you see the arrows, it's one minus delta and then one plus delta and one minus delta, one plus delta. So if you put delta equals zero, you, there's no staggering. And this is just a standard free fermion. It's a metal with Fermi C, so it's critical. The CFT uh, describing this is a Dirac fermion in one plus one. And in that case, you're supposed to find one over three log of, uh, so sorry, now on this slide, the L is turned into W. So the length of the interval is now W, sorry about that. So if delta is zero, if you look at the entanglement entropy of an interval, it's supposed to go at one over three log of L or log W. Well, if it's gap, it should saturate to a value and then stay there. So the, of course, the, when I say it's constant for a gap system, it's constant. All these are asymptotic results is when the size of the interval is big enough. So if you look at the plot in the bottom left, so in orange is uh, the entanglement entropy as a function of the size of the interval for a gapped scenario. So delta is non-zero. And in blue, it's a, it's a critical, it's a gapless case. So for small w, they behave the same. But essentially what's going on is the correlation length. So for the orange, it's gap, but the correlation length is huge. So as so if w is much smaller than the correlation length, the system in fact doesn't realize that it's gapped. It still thinks it's gapless. So it still increase like a one over three log W, but as it gets to a size that's essentially the same order at the correlation length, then it will saturate. And in fact, it will saturate at C over three log of the correlation. So you see very well this saturation while the blue line keeps growing logarithmically. So you have a nice crossover. And you can also, another thing you can, you can use, can be reverse the argument and say, say I want to detect my critical point by looking at the entropy. So you can just take an infinite chain and you say A is half the chain and B is the rest. And you look at the entanglement entropy of the ground state as a function of delta, that's the second plot. So if delta is negative, you find finite entanglement entropy, but as delta goes to zero, you see it's blowing up. What is the red curve? Is that a power? The red curve? Yeah, with no gap. Uh, on the left or the right? Uh, the the uh, plot of the entropy versus the uh, W in the case where you have no oh, the actual function. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know the analytic expression for the for the function. It's a numerical it's not plot. Just, it's not just the power. I not don't. Yeah, yeah, no, because you see, it really goes to a constant for large W, so that's really good. It, Constant and for very small oh. w, it's a c over three log. In between, uh, I mean, there's some kind of crossover. The blue line is exactly one over three log w, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the orange is some kind of crossover between this for small w and constant for large. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's as, as simple as a power law. But uh, maybe I can add something. So wouldn't this be given by um, the integral entropy of a massive Dirac fermion? Uh, uh, well, it's not, I mean, it's only- uh, At long distances. It's universal, you know? it depends on the lattice. It's not well. So it, uh, you could compute it with a field theory uh, if you're really in the regime where the correlation length is much, much larger than the lattice spacing. Mm -hmm. So essentially if you're in the critical regime and maybe in that case, it's not that far off. So I guess in that, in that case, you could compute the crossover, yeah. I got, yeah. Because there is a, like the C function of Zemolochikov for a massive Dirac fermion, which crosses over from one at zero mass to zero at, at infinite mass. Um, and this function is not known exactly, but it's a solution of some differential equation and we have some symptotics, but to compare, yeah. I, I don't um, know if you're supposed to recover the Zamolochikov C function, but that's, that would be a good guess, yeah. That seems reasonable. Interesting. All right, any more question on the, the SSH chain? So, so that was an, an instance of, of non-interacting fermions and entanglement entropy. So th there's a general trick for non-interacting fermions. So non-interacting fermions, you're looking at a quadratic Hamiltonian that you can in, in theory solve, but sometimes it's not completely trivial. But. And then at zero temperature, you just feel the first N excited state, wherever they are. And that's your, that's your state. So in first quantization, your wave function is just a Slater determinant and you ask, and what is the entanglement entropy of this guy? And for most physical quantity, whatever you compute here, like the mean energy or the mean density, it's very quickly after one line of calculation, the, it, the only calculation you have to do is one body. You don't need to treat a many body problem. That's why free fermions are usually very simple. For the entanglement entropy is not, at the end of the day, yeah, you can reduce a problem to the a one body calculation, but it's not, doesn't just, just take one line. And it goes under the name of the special trick. Uh, the philosophy is pretty simple and goes as follows. So you start from a state that obeys Wick theorem. And the state, it obeys Wick theorem if and only if is described by a reduced density matrix, which is the exponential of something quadratic. So the initial state obeys Wick theorem. That means the subsystem A also obeys Wick theorem by construction. That means the reduced density matrix is the exponential of something quadratic. And that's why life is going to be simple. So for sure, you're guaranteed that your row A is exponential of something and that something is quadratic, but you still don't know that you need to compute all these matrix elements, this H, A, I, J. But because of Wick theorem, if you just know the two-point function, so the C, I, J, so which essentially is a propagator, it's C, I, tiger, C, J in your ground state. If you know this for any I, J in A, then you can reconstruct H, R, uh, I, sorry, H, A, so you can re reconstruct the reduced density matrix and out of this, you can get its spectrum. So everything is encoded is in this two point correlation. And so there's various ways to think about this two point correlation. Either you think of it as a fermion propagator, there's too many M's here, or it's just a propagator to the Fermi C, essentially the same operator. So there are in fact two projectors that play a role here. There's a projector to region A, which I've written here. So now I'll move to the continuum because the quantum wall effect is going to be in the continuum. It's not the lattice model. So the projector into region A is just integral over A dx of projector on ket x. And the other operator that's important, I guess I should have mentioned, where did I write this? Here, sorry. So pi is a projector onto the Fermi C, the occupied state. And out of these two guys, you can compute this object, which is the projector PA projected into the Fermi C, which is no longer a projector. So now these eigenvalues of this guy, they're not zero and one anymore. They are between zero and one. And a way to compute them is 
uh, if you if you I don't know if you like numerics, that's pretty easy. You compute this overlap matrix. So the phi i are all the states that are occupied in your system, and you compute this, their overlap, but restricted to region A. So initially they were orthonormal, but now you only integrate over A, so they're no longer orthonormal. You compute that integral is just some complex number, and this matrix is your mission, and you can diagonalize it. And the active, once you know the eigenvalues of this matrix, your problem is solved. So either you do it numerically, and sometimes you're lucky, you can do it analytically. And sorry, and then you have, I'll tell you in a second why it's solved, but maybe before we do that, physically, you can already kind of understand what's going on. So you diagonalize them. That means you essentially, you, you find a new basis you, of, of your occupied state. They're no longer eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, but this, you don't care about this. So the point is now they're orthonormal when you only integrate, well, not orthonormal, they're orthogonal when you only integrate over region A, and the norm is that number between zero and one. So if that number is essentially one, that means your state is completely localized in region A. And if that number is essentially zero, that means your state is completely localized in B. And well, intuitively, you, that, you think that a state that's completely localized in A, it doesn't contribute to the entanglement. It's completely in A. When you cut, it's not affected. If it's completely in B, it's not affected either. So the state that will matter is the state that kind of sits at the boundary between A and B. And these are the states from which lambda is not zero and not one in between. So <clears throat> that's indeed what happens. Because if you look at the reduced density matrix, OK, maybe I'll skip the detail, but at the end of the day, the spectrum so of, uh, of the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix are these pi. So i is any subset of 1n. So 1 to n is the number of electrons in your system. And it's just the product over if j is, j is in i of lambda j times the product of a j not in i of 1 minus lambda j. Uh, that's just a, uh, a painful way to say something very simple. You can think of each j as being a, a, a binary random variable. So you say particle j, let's call it particle j. It's in A with probability lambda j, and it's in B with probability 1 minus lambda j. And now, essentially, this is just a binomial law. You, uh, you ask, pro so <clears throat> the product of j in, so of, uh, so the pi would be the probability that the all the particles with j in i are in part a, and all the other particles are in b. And if you that's that's just a spectrum of uh, Freud. So it, it looks already like a deterministic problem. And in fact, uh, uh, people doing probabilities they will not do quantum mechanics. They will call that uh, they call that <coughs> determinantal point processes, and they will just forget all everything that's quantum mechanics and just look at probability. But it, so the message is. Maybe you diagonalize this matrix, and once you know the lambda i, you know all the spectrum of rho a. If you know the spectrum of rho, of uh, the reduced density matrix, you, your job is done. It's easy to compute the entry. Could, could I just ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, if you have, I mean, you have these determinantal pro processes for the eigenvalues of random matrices, so I'm familiar with that. If you have a, uh, a determinantal process, there's a, there's a kernel. Yeah. And the uh, determinant is formed by the evaluation of, of that kernel at all of the pairs of points. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, if you know what that kernel is, is there some way that you can compute the uh, entanglement entropy or vice versa? Do they contain I, I the think so, yeah, because all you care about is that at the end of the day is, is it, that's a kernel. Cij is a so here it's written on a lattice, so it depends on sites. But in the continuum, this is a function of two positions, and that's your kernel. So essentially, you pick your kernel, and instead, initially, it's a kernel over the whole manifold. But now you think of it as being you restrict it to a subregion A, and then you ask what are the eigenvalues of that that kernel projected to that region A, and that's that's what you need to do. Now it might end up being pretty hard to diagonalize this object, but that's if you can do that, then essentially you've, you've, you've solved the problem. I don't know, does that answer your question? 
uh, if you diagonalize the kernel, you can compute the entanglement entropy. Okay, maybe I'll show you for the, the quantum mole effect, you will see what the kernel is and how things are done. Maybe that, that will help. So maybe let me go through the how, more in a more explicit case, how it looks like. And maybe if it's still not clear, then I'll try to explain uh, differently. All right. Uh, okay, so we have the spectrum of row A and then you can ask various things such as and you can be, before you look at entropy, you can look at something simple, which simpler, which is a full counting statistics, which you can ask. So the, num the number of particle, the number of fermions in region A is now random variable. You can ask what's the distribution. And the distribution is indeed uh, an independent Bernoulli distribution so with a lambda j between the probability of success. So if once you have this, it's easy to compute all the cumulants, for instance. The easiest one is what is the variance of the of the particle number in part A. In the, the mean is trivial typically, it's just something extensive in the region A because all these states we look at, they have translation invariance, so the density is constant. So the mean is not very interesting, but the, the variance is interesting, for instance, and it typically also obeys an area law. But, and you can do the whole distribution. And <clears throat> if we go back to this operator T, T, A, T A here, which was the projector to region A projected into the Fermi surface, into the Fermi C, essentially, is, well, not essentially, the lambda, the lambda I is exactly the eigenvalues of this object. So that means you can rewrite all the quantities you want at some trace of some polynomial of that object, this for the cumulant. And if you look at the entropy, okay, it's not a polynomial, it's a bit of a nasty function, but anyway, if you know the eigenvalue of TA, if you know this lambda J's, then you can compute everything. And this lambda j, computing this lambda j, it's a one body problem. So in that sense, you've reduced the problem of computing entanglement entropy and full counting statistics for uh, non-interacting fermions. You've reduced the many body problem to one body problem, which is the best you can hope for for free fermions. And okay, it, it's interesting for doing exact calculation, but even at the level of numerics, that's also, in, that means you can do huge system on a small computer. You don't need to deal with a huge many body Hilbert space. You can focus on this one electron. Again, just uh, slipping in something from random matrices. Is there any kind of universality property here which says that the kernel really doesn't care about the detailed nature of the background? Well, now actually, the, the kernel is going to be quite is going to be typically sensitive to the microscopic detail. Uh, so the kernel is really is just to propagate if you uh, it's a propagator of your fermions. It's a probability of if you destroy an electron here, the probability is that it appears here. And I don't know. For instance, if you can look in the first Landau, lowest land on the, uh, I'll explain a bit in a bit what our Landau level, but there are several Landau levels and they're all kind of equivalent and they would give the same area low. But if you look at the kernel in all these Landau levels, they're different. So the kernels are not universal here. I don't really expect that. But what's more universal is the entanglement entropy. But on the, so that being said, there will be some kind of the, the spectrum of the kernel will turn out to be have some kind of universality in the quantum mole effect. I'll mention that in a bit. So not really yes, not really no either, but it's not like, it's not as strongly universal as you would get for a random matrix theory when you really, whatever starting problem you, the problem you started with, you always end up with the same distribution. You, you know, here, typically, the kernel can be different. All right, so now let's move on to the integer quantum mole effect. Yeah, I see time is flying. <laughs> so integer quantum mole effect, so that's a physical system we, to which we want to apply this, this algorithm, so to speak. So what's a system is you take electrons and you confine them to two dimension. So they're really, so. For instance, let's say they're on a plane, but later we'll put them on various manifolds, but just on surfaces, two dimensional manifolds. And you put a uniform magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. So you are Hamiltonian for, and there's no interaction. So Hamiltonian for one electron is just 
kinetic energy. So P minus QA, A is a gauge vector or the connection, if you want that responsible for the, the vector field or the curvature. And you pick a gauge, for instance, that's called the symmetric gauge. You write down your Hamiltonian, looks like this, looks a bit messy. You can first simplify it by removing all everything that has a dimension. In fact, there are, there are two, uh, <clears throat> two scales. There's an energy scale, which is a cyclotron frequency. It's a classical quantity. It's if you put an electron in a magnetic field, it rotates at a certain frequency. That's purely classical. So it's QB over M. Q is the mass, is a charge of the electron. B is the magnetic field, M is the mass. And there's a length scale that's purely quantum, doesn't exist in the classical problem because there's so much bar in it. Screwed h bar over qb, it's just some length scale. So it will uh, come back later, but roughly speaking, once you, we're gonna look at electron, we're gonna project them at low energy in this magnetic field, uh, where you can't localize them completely, they're gonna occupy some kind of space. So, you know, it's a bit like the Heisenberg principle that you can't know position and momentum at the same time. In the quantum mold effect for electron in the lowest Landau level, you can't know X and Y at the same time. So the more precision you have on X, the less precision you have on, on Y. So there's some kind of quantum fuzziness and that's a typical size of this quantum fuzziness. And once you remove this, this dimension uh, full quantities and you move to complex variables, things become very simple. Your Hamiltonian is just A dagger A plus one half. And uh, every physicist is now very happy. You recognize uh, it's, it's the same Hamiltonian as a harmonic oscillator. And in particular, the spectrum is simple because A dagger A only takes integer positive eigenvalues. So the lowest energy is H bar omega C over two. And then the next one is H bar omega C higher and then H bar omega C higher. But the feature that's quite different from a harmonic oscillator is that each eigenvalue is massively determined. There's not just one state for each eigenvalue, there's infinitely many, at least on the plane. And in particular, we're gonna focus on the lowest energy state. So all these states, they form these Landau levels. So we're gonna look at the n equals zero. So the energy is h bar omega c over two. And what are the wave function? It's a wave function that are annihilated by the operator A. And when you write down what these are, they're just, so it's a function of X and Y, but it's useful to use complex, uh, complex coordinates. So they're any holomorphic function times this Gaussian factor e to the minus X squared plus Y squared over four AB squared. So they all have that same Gaussian factor, but in front of it is any, absolutely any, well, L2 integrable uh, holomorphic function. So that's why there's infinitely many. So in some, a, a, for instance, a basis is to take f of z equals one, then f of z equals z, then z squared, z cubed, z three, and you have infinitely many states in the lowest Landau level. And up to that Gaussian factor that in fact you could remove by doing a, a non-unitary gate transformation, you could just get rid of it. So it's just holomorphic wave functions. All right. Sorry, again, a naive question. Uh, yeah. Is the degeneracy related to the topology or not? The topology of what? Well, the surface. So it will be, well, well it, it does depend on the topology and it depends on the magnetic flux. But that will become maybe more clear. In this. So here's a degeneracy, it's infinite because the surface is non-compact, it's a plane. On a compact surface, it will be finite and it will depend on it will depend on topology and it will depend on the magnetic flux, yeah. And if it were a sphere, there would be no degeneracy? Uh, no, there will be, but depends on the, how much magnetic field there is. Uh -huh. yeah. If there is zero, zero magnetic field, there's just one state. And if it's, and what well, turns out, well, okay, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm skipping ahead too much. We just, uh, so, so these are our wave function on the plane. I'll mention later how it works when it's not the plane. And uh, what's pretty striking is this, this holomorphicity and uh, the, it breaks one obvious symmetry is that uh, it's not mirror symmetric. I mean, if you do the mirror image, you would have anti-holomorphic function. So what breaks this mirror image or time, it also breaks time reversal or well, it's a magnetic field that breaks all this. Um, <clears throat> And so the, 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 the quantum anybody state that we're gonna consider is we're gonna completely fill the lowest Landau level. We're gonna occupy all these guys with electron and that's it. 
and so it's a gap state because if you want to if you look at the first excitations you have to create a particle hole excitation so take an electron from the lowest middle level and put it in the next and there's a gap a gap h bar omega c so for sure that's a gap state so we do expect an area law and if you actually maybe the first what word the of this what about the exclusion principle you say you put all the electrons in the same state not in the same state in the same it is a whole band of states here schematically you see the all these are different states you see here the so the states in the lowest Landau level there's infinitely many uh, so so there's some hidden quantum number there's not just the uh, energy of there is a, yeah exactly yeah 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 I'll, I'll, I think it's next in two slides. I'll say what's the what's the quantum number if you want to. That's responsible for this. Uh, <clears throat> so if you if you project everything to the lowest Landau level, so if you take for instance the x and y operator, that I mean they commute. But if you project them to the lowest Landau level, they don't commute anymore. I call them x x hat and y hat here, and the commutator is now i time l b squared. So there is this, this uncertainty principle. So if you demand that your electron is in the lowest Landau level, then you can't localize it completely in X and Y. There's an uncertainty principle. And if you do a semi-classical quantization, it tells you immediately that each electron on the lowest Landau level occupies an area of two pi LB squared. And that's, that's, that's a semi-classical way to understand the degeneracies. So two pi LB squared is something that's proportional to the magnetic flux. It's the area through which exactly one flux quantum is piercing. So the stronger the magnetic fields, the more states there will be in the lowest Landau level. And okay, so, and why is, it, why is this degeneracy coming from? It's come from translation invariance, because you work on a plane, you, you have L2 integrable functions, so they can't be invariant by translation. So typically they look like, like little, a little Gaussian wave packet, and you can just move it around. So that's why this is a degeneracy. But there's one little feature that's weird or unusual in the <clears throat> in the quantum mole effect because of the magnetic field. Uh, it's called traditionally you used to translation in the x direction and the y direction to commute. Because well, the generators are just d over dx, d over dy, that's commute. But here it's a bit more tricky because when you do a translation, actually, if you check out my initial problem. That Hamiltonian is not obviously invariant by translation because the gauge field, the connection, if you want, matrix, depends on x and y explicitly. So if you do a translation, if you want to go back to the initial Hamiltonian, you also have to do a gauge transformation. So every time you do translation, what you do is like translation plus gauge transformation. And because of this, translation in the x and y direction, they no longer commute. Uh, so in fact, if you do a translation in u and then v and then minus u and then minus v, you back at the same point, but the operator you get is not identity, it's your phase. And the phase is just, uh, well, the flux of the magnetic field through, the, through this parallelogram. So it's, to some sense, it's a sort of bomb effect. But anyway, this is translation that, that's what's responsible for this degeneracy. And okay, the, the degeneracy is, is infinite, but that's a bit artificial. That's because the, the manifold was non-compact. What if you do this on the torus? Torus is nice, it's compact. So it takes a complex plane and you just do a, a quotient by some, some lattice. Uh, <clears throat> and then you have to say, okay, what are my boundary conditions? Uh, so the, I don't know, I guess every time, the, the, the first time someone looks at this, you just say, well, I'm gonna put periodic boundary conditions on my wave function. And then you find that it's not consistent. But that's because what you really have to impose is when you do a translation by, Sorry, so here that easier side a blackboard, but you have to think of this parallelogram. So this here is L1 and here is L2 e to the i theta. So the, the unit cell of my torus is a is a tilted rectangle. So when I translate this way, I must get the same wave function up to maybe I'm allowed to add a phase. I can put some, some flux through my torus. And when I do translation this way, I also get the same wave function. But you have to re you recall that a translation is not a simple translation, it's a translation coupled to gauge transformation. That are the proper boundary condition to put. And furthermore, just consistency demands that if you translate this way and this way, or this way and this way, you must get the same phase. 
that means the total magnetic flux has to be quantized through your torus or just things again are not consistent. So <clears throat> this is true. And if you pick some gauge, may I, here I, I picked this, uh, this Landau gauge, why not? There's just a choice. You, and you find that uh, the wave function in the, well, the boundary conditions or your wave function are as follows. So all these phases you can kill if you want, they're inessential. So it is periodic when you shift by L1, but when you shift by L2, it's actually quite complicated. So if you want the function you end up with, your wave function is not a function. It's a section on some line bundle. And that line bundle turns out to be non-trivial because of the magnetic field, because in fact, the magnetic field is nothing but the curvature of that bundle. So it's only trivial if the magnetic field is zero. If it's non-zero, the magnetic field and non-trivial line bundle. And well, then you can solve your problem. You find here some, some, some Nazi theta functions, but more generally, you just find some holomorphic sanction in some holomorphic bundle, line bundle over your surface. So yeah, that's more of a generic. Now you take any oriented surface where it has to be oriented. If not, you can't put a magnetic field on it. A magnetic field is a two form. You want it here to be non-zero everywhere. You pick a metric and the first thing you have to say, you have to have a uniform magnetic field. So it means that if you want the magnetic field is proportional to the Riemannian volume form. So per unit area, you have a constant flux. Uh, <clears throat> And well, then you run into the usual trouble uh, <coughs> because you're on a compact surface and, uh, and the integral of the magnetic field is non-zero. Well, it's not possible to write uh, the magnetic field as a rotational of something because if you could by stock theorem, the flux would be zero. That means A, your, what, what we, A we will usually think of it as a one form, but here it's only defined piecewise it's because well, it's not a one form, it's a connection. And okay, and quantum mechanically there's a quantization condition so that the integrate flux, the total flux of the magnetic field must be quantized in unit of, in, of two pi h bar. So I've, I've put the charge of the particle in the two one. Or uh, if, you, if you're more uh, of a geometer, it's that F must have integer cohomology class. It's the same thing. It, but if this work, then that means you can, the, the, the quantum mechanical problem makes sense. Wave function are some section in some holomorphic line bundle. And it turns out what is the lowest Landau level is just the holomorphic sections of this holomorphic line bundle. But again, a naive question, excuse me. Uh, is, I, I mean, it looks like the experimentalist is the one who chooses the magnetic field, but you're saying he can't choose it. It's got to be quantized. Ah, uh, is, it something a... like, is it something like flux quantization in superconductors that it's just that's excluded? That's a very good question. So in fact, experimentally, the question never arises because here we're talking about uh, flux through a compact surface. Like imagine a sphere and you would want your magnetic field to have a, a non-zero flux through that sphere. That would require you to, 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 that would require that to put a, a magnetic monopole inside that sphere. And this, as far as we know, do not exist. Mm -hmm. So unless an experimentalist can find a magnetic monopole, he can't even, so maybe the more, so that was a, the, the theorist answer a bit as a joke. So the, the more reasonable answer that in practice, the theory is they never have compact surfaces. They're, they work on a plane or a piece of a plane and just they actually have a boundary. And the boundary, um, if time allows, I'll talk at the end, but well, I'm not sure I have time. But the boundary is also very important in the quantum model effect. Because I said it's a gap system and it, so it's an insulator, but in fact, at the edge, you have massless modes. And the edge also are a very important part of this story. So working on a compact surface is just a theory trick to avoid boundaries while having a finite degeneracy. But that's not, that's not experimentally relevant to work on a compact surface. And so that, 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 that question that actually was a, a good question, but in fact, never occurs because that's a situation that's experimentally irrelevant. It's, but it's what not... actually occurs, you say, is that it's a bounded uh, surface, but is there some phenomenon like a flux quantization as in superconductivity that is just excluded except in multiples of some unit? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, 
I don't think so, because you, you don't have like a super sharp boundary in, in this system. You can typically put a confining potential and you, then you have your magnetic fields everywhere. So, I mean, wh where does exactly the sample ends is it's a bit of a, so I'm not even sure it makes sense to say what is like rigorously, how much flux is going through my system? Well, if I can't even say exactly where it ends, can't even really define it. So I'm not too sure how you'd see whether you've have, have exactly a, a quantized number of fluxes or not. Uh, what happened at the boundary is a bit, mm. all right. So to come back to your question, now what is the degeneracy with respect to topology? So it essentially, so now K is, so we say it's a flux of the magnetic field on the compact surface, okay, although it's not relevant for experiment, but at least for theorists, it, it makes sense. Or you can do that on a computer. So it's two pi, two pi h bar times some integer k. So the semi-classical arguments tell you that the degeneracy is k for k very large. And that's true. But in fact, there's a quantum correction, which is one minus genus. So the exact degeneracy is k plus one minus genus. So in the sphere, it's just k plus one. So it's, ne it's never zero. All right, and now, okay, that's just a setup. That's, that's a system we, we're gonna look at. So we feel completely that lowest Landau level on a compact surface or on the plane without, so no boundary, either we feel completely the plane or we avoid for now any mention of boundaries in the system. And then we have to look at the, we have to, so the, 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 the kernel, so what's gonna be the kernel here, it's a projector to the lowest Landau level. And so it's a one body quantity. So you the phi n are the <clears throat> orbitals in the lowest lambda level and you, the kernel is just this. And you can compute that kernel on flat on the flat plane on the plane. That's pretty easy. And you find it's just, uh, it's just a Gaussian exponential minus K distance squared. So it decays exponentially even faster than exponentially it's a Gaussian. And what plays the role of the correlation lens is one over k, and so sorry, one over square root of k, which is, in fact, if I went back to the units I had at the beginning, that's the magnetic lens. So the magnetic lens is the correlation lens in that system. So that's uh, okay. So that's that's on the plane because you can solve things exactly. Of course, if you have some arbitrary surface with an arbitrary metric, you can't solve things exactly. But there are semi-classical results about that that propagator. So that kernel, it goes under the name of Bernal kernel in the mathematical literature. Uh, and for instance, on the diagonal for large K is just homogeneous, it's just K over two pi. So you have uniform density, at least at, at the semi-classical level. It turns out there are corrections, but they'll be, they'll be constant. So all the, all the results we're gonna use now is for very large magnetic field. So very large magnetic field here, that means that means many, many electrons in my lowest Landau level. So that's the thermodynamic limit. So in that set, in that setup, thermodynamic limit is the same thing as very large K, and it's the same thing as very small H bar. So semi-classical limit equals thermodynamic limit here. So that's that's very convenient. And so essentially there's lots that's known about that kernel on, on arbitrary surfaces. Like very much like the heat kernel. It's, it's, I mean, it's been studied and we know some things. I mean, mathematician, I should say, knows something. Uh, so I go ask mathematician. So, and that's especially, that's what, that's Laurent Charles, one of Laurent Charles' specialty, all these things. And <clears throat> so, so, so together, but I must say he did all the, all the mathematical aspects, which were most of that project. Uh, so we managed to prove that indeed the quantum mole effect obey the real law. So essentially what it entails, it's controlling the kernel of, of that propagator of, sorry, controlling the spectrum of that kernel was once restricted to region A. And what you find is that the trace of any function of, of your, your kernel, be it a polynomial, if you want to control the full counting statistics or be it this function, let me flash it back. If you want the entanglement entropy, you put this function, but any well-behaved function that well-behaved meaning that vanishes fast enough uh, at zero and one. So you want to get rid of all these states that are completely localized in A, 
that's eigenvalue one and completely localizing B that's eigenvalue zero. So as long as you get rid of this guy, you look at the distribution of states at the boundary that is in fact universal, at least in these systems. It doesn't matter what is a, what is a surface, what is a metric, none of this matters. And what you find is that the spectrum of this operator has some universal distribution that's given in terms of the error function. Uh, at least for these eigenvalues that are not zero and not one, but in between, because most of these eigenvalues, of course, are zero and one. The number of eigenvalues in zero and the number of eigenvalues that are around one, these are extensive. And there's a sub-extensive correction, which is proportional to the area law, of eigenvalues that sit in between. And physically, they correspond to quantum state that really sit at the boundary of A. So this is universal distribution, and that explains why you, you get the area law, essentially. And do I have like five more minutes? Yeah, oh, okay. So I can flash, okay, uh, that's not so, I'll just say in, 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 in 30 seconds, then you can look at subleading correction. So the so leading term is always the same with, uh, so you find, uh, you find maybe, let me put here. There's some coefficient here that if you fix a function f, if say you look at entropy, f doesn't change. So alpha is just some number and it's the same number. It does, it's not sensitive to uh, topology, it's not sensitive to geometry, it's the same always. So you have the same area law, no matter if you're on the torus or the sphere or the plane, same area law with the same prefactor, sensitive to nothing. But now if you look at the correction, then you start to be sensitive on geometry. So exactly what do you probe? So the first term is the area law, then the, and it, it's in one, if you put back the units, it's in one over the magnetic lens. So it's, it blows up as one over the, the UV cutoff. And the first correction, it, it's in proportional to the magnetic lens, so it goes to zero when you send the LB to zero. And essentially it's an integral over the boundary of A of anything that's local and intrinsic and geometric in your things. So there are just two quantities. There's a geodesic curvature of the boundary. So it tells you the boundary, how far is it from being geodesic? So you get this, it's a little kappa squared. And the other in intrinsic thing you have is an intrinsic curvature of the manifold itself. So if you're in the sphere, for instance, there's some intrinsic curvature. So there's an integral of this over the boundary. So you can start to probe the geometry of, of your, of the boundary of A as corrections to the entanglement entry. Uh, all right, so maybe to be compared to, uh, I mentioned quickly that for 1D system, you had exponentially small correction to the area low. And in 2D system, you are rather have algebraic correction. So here you do have this algebraic correction. So this area law, constant term, actually I should have mentioned is zero as you expect because it's topologically trivial. So you prove that the gamma topo is actually zero here. And the first correction, then even subleading and it just depends on the geometry. Uh, all right. And now, well, let's introduce the last important piece for the quantum wall effect, which is the boundary. So how do you add a boundary to your system? Say you work on the plane, you put a confining potential. And now when you put your Fermi, your Fermi uh, energy, you're gonna on, only feel states uh, that are I mean, schematically in just some, some finite region of the plane. So let's, for instance, in that picture, what I had in mind was you put a potential that only depend on X, but that translation invariant in the Y direction. So what is your quantum or droplet gonna look like? So in the X direction, you're only gonna have electron between A and B, but in the Y direction, your, your, your liquid is gonna keep going forever. So you have a strip of quantum mole liquid. And in particular, you have two edges. You have a left edge and a right edge. And the phenomen phenomenology of the quantum mole, uh, of the integer quantum mole effect is that while the, the bulk, the inside is gapped, there's no way to make a, a current flow in the bulk. There is current that flows at the edges. So you have the gap, the bulk is gapped, but the edges are gapless. And they're one dimensional gapless. So they should be described as some one dimensional conformal field theory. And turns out they are. The only weird feature is that they are chiral. They only ever go one way. So the right edge here will can only propagate up and the left edge can only propagate down. So now what you can do is say, okay, I'm gonna again, split my system in two. I'm gonna declare my region A is this rectangle. 
and the rest is my region B. And then I'm going to increase the size, the width of my region A. And okay, you're going to have two contribution essentially to the <clears throat> to the entanglement entropy. You're going to have the area law that comes from the bulk. It's proportional to the to the size of the boundary of A in the bulk. So it's a, it's the width twice the width of uh, of the blue strip. But as you vary L, this is not going to vary. That's constant. So if you vary L, the bulk area law remains constant. But the one thing that does not remain constant, well, is L. So it's how large of an interval you're sampling on the critical 1D system. And if it's a critical 1D system, you expect to recover that Carney law, this C over 3 log L. So question is, does it work? Well, it does work. You can do that calculation. That's what we did uh, with uh, Jean-Marie Stéphane. And you find that uh, if you remove the terms coming from the bulk, what's left is indeed uh, for the entropy. So it's here, <clears throat> C over six times log L. Uh, here C equals one. So the one difference is today, uh, before today. So I don't know, 40 minutes ago, I told you that you should find C over three log L, but that's because normally one looks at CFTs at this non carol You have left mover and right mover. So here you have only half because it's just left movers or right movers. I mean, you only have, it's a carol it's a chiral CFT, so you find half. And you can even, okay, if, and that kind of tells you what the CFT is. It's a C equals one chiral fermion. But okay, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a doubter, you might say, well, all you can say is C plus C bar equals one. Maybe it's um, C equals one half and it's non chiral. So there's a way to probe this is now you take several intervals, not just one, and you can compute the entropy with several intervals, which is much richer information than the central charge. You essentially probe the whole spectrum. And you find that a bit complicated. So you have a bunch of interval that goes from UA to VA. So U1 to V1, U2 to V2, etc. You have a bunch of interval and you can compute the entropy and compare with CFT prediction. And then you guarantee what you get, you've identified for certain, you do have a Dirac fermion, which is what, what you expect from general arguments. So I guess that's a good time to stop. Yeah, details. Uh, so that's it. These are the two papers. So the first one is about the proof of the area law with Laurent Charles. And uh, the last one uh, is a work with Jean-Marie Stéphane uh, about probing the edge of the quantum mole effect. All right, thank you very much. Et merci, euh, merci Benoît pour euh, la belle présentation. It was uh, very interesting. I have uh, a lot of questions. We had already numerous questions. Uh, so John is forbidden to ask more questions. I'm just kidding. Uh, but if anyone in the audience has uh, any questions, um, you can do so now. You can raise your hand or I might have a question, if, if I may. Yes, uh, Luke. Uh, uh, one or two. Uh, if you give or put very, uh, you know, uh, regular geometry, suppose you, you take a, uh, a disk for your uh, uh, the geometry in uh, your uh, quantum all uh, state, uh, do you get the more uh, analytical result? Can you push the exactness of the computations? I thought that's my first question. And the other, I was curious if you know of a commuting operator with the Bergman uh, kernel or integral operator. So, okay, okay, let's go. So the first one, you mean uh, you want the quantum mole droplet to be a disk or the region A to be a disk? The region A, yes. Uh, so, as okay. I understand, you use some functional analysis to 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 get your at your result, and then you could uh, get the subleading corrections that were probing the geometry. But what what if the geometry is very very as regular as it can be? Yeah. So so the the the, the case that's favorable is when you preserve uh, it's when your cut preserve a symmetry. So the disk would be such a case. Yeah. You don't break rotational invariance. So. In that case, you can di diagonalize this initial that that matrix. Uh, that, let me show you. 
this matrix here, well, because you, you preserve a quantum number, if you pick eigenstates of rotations, this will automatically be uh, diagonal. So you will have analytically these eigenvalues. And if I'm correct, in the case of a disk, it's going to be some incomplete gamma function. And the last part of the job is to write. Uh, so you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a series of this of of this. Uh, so you, now you have to compute some kind of power series of this in, of this gamma function. So you, you have a cross form expression, but it's still you have an infinite sum. And this, I'm not too sure. Uh, so you you can do you, you can approximate it in 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 the same limit as we've been doing using some shallow point or things like this. But to get a cross form expression that's better than that series, I'm not sure. I don't know how to do it. My my second my other question. You know, I've been I, I really enjoyed your talk. It was very clear and very interesting. I, I I'm promoting the use of horn like operators. You know coming from the, the band and time limiting problems to compute the uh, uh, entanglement. And uh, I would suspect that uh, there should be a, a, a commuting differential operator with the integral uh, kernel that you, or integral operator that you're using. But I don't know, this would be the starting point to use these mm. uh, band and time limiting approaches. So- Differential operator, well. Because say, you know, to the question of John, it, it's, you could have the typical examples to have the sink kernel. And then it's well known that the spheroidal uh, operator commutes with that. And then you could diagonalize that instead of the integral operator you're playing. Well, yeah. so that's a simplification that uh, is so quite what could I don't know here? I don't you know. Don't know. I, I, no, it's you. You would know or or not. I, I was just curious. Yeah, but right. if I had a guess, if you're looking for a, something that commutes, so that that kernel is just a projector onto the lowest band. So I would guess you'd say it commutes with the annihilation operator. And the annihilation operator is a differential operator. But then what what you're gonna do with this? I don't know. <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll think about it. But the... Okay. Manu, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, please go. So uh, in the real quantum Hall effect, uh, at, for sure for the fractional, but for the, I think for the integer also, um, the electrons get tied with the flux tube. And I think the homogeneity of the magnetic field is no longer truly valid. And so my question is, can you do uh, some calculations when you have flux tubes? Yeah, so in fact, this flux tube picture, it's a mean field approximation to solve. It's just an approximation. There's nothing to do with actually flux tube attaching to electron. It's just, it's a the composite fermion picture. It's just a mean field approach to the interacting case, it, which gives a physical it's nothing real. There's no actual tubes attaching to electron. It's just a mean field approximation to the fractional case. It, it gives results. Surely there's some. It gives results. It. It's just because, but it's a mean field. It's an approximation. Okay. It has nothing real to do with. I, I, I mean, I find that hard. Okay, hard to believe. I'll just say uh, that. It, it um, is a mean field approach, and mean fields are approximations. Sure, it's an approximation, but it has. But in practice, by what mechanism would the magnetic field look? That just doesn't happen. That no one claims that's what physically happens. It's just, it's just a mean field picture. Uh, if you have Dirac fermions instead of Schrodinger equation, yeah, mm -hmm. you you will induce, for example, Chern-Simons terms, or um, you will change the dynamics of the electromagnetic fields, and you can surely expect flux tubes to form. But I mean, I don't know what further okay. to ask. So that's, that takes me where I don't know. As far as I know, it's just a, it's just a picture too, but it's, it's nothing to do with reality. Mm. But okay. I might be wrong. <laughs> mm. 
Do we have other questions? Uh, I have a question, but if uh, someone else wants to ask, my son probably has questions. <laughs> Sorry, it's the pandemic uh, working mode. So Benoit, if you go back to your uh, expression for the entropy uh, and a generic manifold. Uh, with the, the one with the corrections or? Yes, it's with the corrections. Uh, yeah. So the LD term, so if I work on a plane, then the second term vanishes. Yes. So there's no curvature. Mm -hmm. uh, and then only the first term remains, the beta term. Yeah. And so then kappa is the extrinsic curvature of the boundary of A? It's just a curvature of the boundary of A, yeah. Okay, so, so for a disk, it's like constant. Luke was asking, this term remains. For a disk, that term remains. It's essentially one over R squared times integrated over the perimeter. So that gives you one over R. So you find an LB over R term. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and that's the first correction. And uh, beta, okay, beta you give below. Beta is some, me... some, you can compute it, yeah. You, if you so choose what, your what, function f. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, if you what, look at- What the, is at, lambda? Okay, lambda is some other thing. It's some, yeah. It's not very, I don't know. There might be some way to write this in a more nice looking way, but. But these are explicit expression. And so you pick your function. If you want the variance, the function is just, so f of t is t minus t squared. It's not very complicated. Mm -hmm. and that gives you the, you can compute beta of f, this is some integral. If you want the entropy, it's a different function. So the, it, so if you change, the, the, the quantity will just change the, the beta, but the rest will be the same. Mm -hmm. And so is there a, physical meaning that is beta? Because I mean, these are complex, complicated functions. Yeah, I mean, even the alpha uh, is a prefactor of the area law. I don't have a physical- yeah, But meaning. the alpha, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's, that's correct. The, and, I mean, none of them, I don't have any, I mean, they're not universal. Uh, but, you know, I mean, they're not universal, but it's it's pretty beautiful uh, what's, what beta multiplies, right? You have this, this very geometric object. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, same for the other part uh, on a curved manifold. So uh, this is more interesting in some sense than the area law. This term is richer. The other the one is paper by Vishwanath and uh, Grover and Turner, I think, when they they conjectured that this is always true for that. So the, that the entanglement entropy, you have a topological part, fine, but mm -hmm. also then you have a part that's purely local and that always has this kind of expansion because at the end of the day. You, you have quantum states that you can, in, in that semi-classical limit, you can localize them smaller and smaller. So you can only probe local geometric quantities at the boundary and nothing else. So that's the only kind of stuff. So of course there's further terms as it's gonna be kappa to the four or maybe kappa squared times R. So you have sub, but everything has to be local and intrinsic. So you, I guess you do expect this kind of expansion, not just in, in the quantum mode effect. Okay, so what they argued in general, you were able to prove exactly. In that case, we can check that it, it pops up, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so do you have the same LB term for the fractional quantum Hall effect? So I take a uh, Laughlin wave wow. function at one third tilling. Yeah. There's a constant part, then will that be the next? Uh... Okay, if you if you believe in, in the paper I just mentioned, it should be there. But numerically, it's really it's pretty hard to already get the, the constant term. So subleading correction is I think it's out of reach numerically, and analytically, analytically I don't know of yeah. any method to compute any, even the leading term. But so mathematically, is it proven that it's the area law for fractional quantum Hall state, the Laughlin one? No, it's just it's just numerics. Just numerics. Just numerics. Essentially, hmm. the rough picture is for the fractional quantum wall effect. There's only numerical results. There's no proof of anything. If you act the mathematician, you can prove nothing. You can't even prove that the Laughlin state is gapped. That's that's right. Uh, Haldane always mentions this as an outstanding problem. 
So here's a big challenge for all the math people. That's so much. So I'm looking into it. That's in Grenoble. Is Nicolas Rougerie is one of his. Uh, I think it's his live dream, proving that Laughlin's gap. But yeah. I mean, it's it's much harder with the interactions. But here you can do things because it's it's non-interactive. That's that's much 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 easier. But the fractional case, you can you can check that things work the same, but it's numerics. It works if you believe in numerics, and I, I do believe in numerics. So it's it's solid numerics, but it's not. You can't just do things on a piece of paper. Okay, great. And I think we run out of time. May, may I so, risk an uh, extreme question? I mean, uh, sure, Ivan, uh, Ivan, please. Is, is there one, one spin chain that we know when the A and the B regions are taken very differently than the, the one you propose and everybody has, has studied? For example, take A, all the spins on odd side yeah. and B, all the even side. I think people have looked at these things. Uh, I think that. So what what the area law becomes? I mean, is the. Ah, I think it's massively violated. I was I would expect it to be extensive in that. Well. Or extensive in what's not? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, the, there are the the rainbow models where it's broken. Mm -hmm. So the, there are there are known examples. Either. Yeah. 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 But rainbow model, is you still, still use kind of standard. Or is it, I mean, hmm? is it uh, useful to study that, or uh, it's only a curiosity? Uh, well, I, I, so I was mentioning that usually the entanglement entropy is useful when the, you you kind of tie it to locality. So it's important that you look at the ground state of local Hamiltonian and that you really do a spatial cut. That that's where we have these these insights of of Ariolo and and that's that's the kind of entropy that's relevant for all these tensor networks codes. But if you rather think of the entanglement entropy as more of an abstract tool for theorists to probe quantum state, then why not? You know, any kind of cut, if that gives you some insight, if you say, okay, I'm gonna split into odd sites, even sites, and well, if this happens, it's critical. If this happens, it's got, that that why not? That that could be a probe. But uh, I mean, that's, I, I seem to remember some people looking at that even odd cut, but I'm not certain. So I, I don't even remember. I'm not sure they did it, so I for sure don't remember what they would have found. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So Ivan can do it and tell us uh, about it next week. <laughs> No, but it's interesting. It's uh, I also remember people doing this in uh, two spatial dimensions for some topological phases, and they take a, sorry, there's some background, but some patches uh, that are non-connected for region A, you know, yeah. like a checkerboard and a, oh, and actually, a yeah, chess no, yeah. board, all the black squares. No. Now I actually think of something. If you look at three fermions with a really a Fermi, a Fermi a Fermi seizures, you have a dispersion relation in K-space and you typically you feel in K-space a connected region that's your Fermi surface. If you do this and you do find this, well, area law plus log violation, but what you can do it instead of feeling a spatial region in K-space, you can like feel a checkerboard for instance. And then th that will heavily modify the law. And turns out for this model, there's a duality between real space and momentum space. So it's completely mathematically equivalent as taking a proper good Fermi surface and taking your region A to be in real space a checkerboard. So, so that, that will for sure mess up the area law. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think now <laughs> would be a good time to uh, thank Benoit. Um, so, merci Benoit for the excellent talk. Uh, and uh, next week we'll have uh, Meng Cheng from Yale talking about uh, fractons. Uh, so please uh, join. And uh, Benoit, again, thanks for answering all the questions and uh, good night. It's pretty late in France. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.